Hello, everyone, and thank you for coming to our first MSME Latinx alumni panel session hosted by the Department of Management Science and Engineering and the MSME Career Collaborative Program at Stanford. My name is Linda Esquivel, and I'm your host and moderator for today's session. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome back and introduce our panelists and MSME alums, David Medina, who serves as an, as an intellectual property lawyer at Oric, Harrington, and Sutcliffe LLP. David received his BS in MSME and a Doctor of Law from Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law. Mariana Barraza, who serves as an implementation consultant at Stripe. Mariana received her bachelor's in MSME from Stanford and an MBA from UCLA, Anderson School of Management. And then Jose Villetes, the co-founder and director at Boomtown Accelerators. Jose received his bachelor's in MSME from Stanford and a master's in computer science from the University of Colorado Boulder. Um, without further ado, I'll let them go ahead and tell a little bit more about yourself, and basically maybe where you grew up and then how you ended up, up at Stanford. I can start. Hi, everybody. My name is David Medina. I'm class of 09. Um, I'm from SoCal. And uh, since going to Stanford, I've kind of bounced around the world. Um, I did the SETI program uh, and lived in Japan while I was a junior at Stanford. And then after graduation, I lived in the Bay. And then for law school, I'm a lawyer, as Linda said. For law school, I moved to Arizona. And then I lived in DC for a while. And then back in the Bay. And then uh, a little before a year ago, I, I was living in Japan again. And then most recently moved back to LA. So it, uh, it's been a whirlwind since graduation and covered a lot of ground. And happy to share in the thoughts and comments on any of it. Jose, did you want to? Uh, sure. Yeah, I thought uh, we got to go. And, and David, I just noticed your your background is not fake. That's a pretty cool office you've got. So. <laughs> thanks. Um, uh, I'm Jose Vietas. Uh, uh, as uh, Linda mentioned, thanks for having us. Um, so I, I'm kind of I was class of '11, uh, MSNE undergrad, and kind of lived all over the world. I went to like 12 different schools before I came to Stanford. Uh, lived in Puerto Rico, Dominican Republic, Spain, Miami. I uh, did high school in LA um, and then stayed in the Bay Area for about three years after graduating, uh, doing the startup thing, and then moved to Colorado around eight years ago now. And uh, yeah, been out here since then. And uh, yeah, I did, I guess, uh, the entrepreneurship track uh, or innovation track, I guess. I forgot what it's called now uh, for MSNE. So. And I can go next. Um, I'm Mariana Barraza. I grew up in Long Beach, um, also Southern California. Um, born and raised here, uh, went to Long Beach Poly. I always kind of like to point out that it was the same high school as Snoop Dogg and Cameron Diaz, uh, little fun fact. Um, was class of 2012 at Stanford, um, minored in human biology after taking two years of pre-med and realizing that it wasn't for me and switched over to MSNE. So I can kind of touch on that later on. Um, immediately after school, I moved to DC and spent about two years there. Then moved back to California, um, LA specifically, but as I was in consulting, I kind of bounced around for project work, um, ended up going to Anderson, so stayed local, just graduated last June, and currently still in LA until our office reopens and I move up to the Bay Area. So kind of happy to talk on or about any of those experiences. Okay, so the first question is, um, how has your experiences at Stanford prepare you for your current career? All right, I'll jump in since I already have. I, I would say uh, MSD is a pretty flexible degree. You cover a lot of ground. You don't necessarily go too deep. Um, but the breadth of what I studied, I think kind of served as some of the core background that I use as a lawyer. So one thing I didn't uh, mention is that I'm an intellectual property lawyer, which means I deal with patents, copyrights, trademarks, and trade secrets. Um, and what we do, I, I'm a litigator as well. So that means, you know, we fight about stuff. I'm not, I'm not the type of patent lawyer who writes the patent. I'm the one who fights about it. And so what that means is in my day-to-day -day work, there's always new technology. There's always a new fight about some, something cutting edge. And I think just being at Stanford and being used to, you know, what's new, what's in, what's being developed kind of gets you prepared for that and gets you ready to handle 
kind of the constantly changing world and, and you know, be ready for it. So. Cool. Yeah, um, I think for me, uh, I guess we just keep the same order if we want, but uh, Mariana, feel free to jump in too, um, if you like. But um, I think what, what I loved about MSNE uh, uh, similarly is how broad it was and how you get a little bit of a taste in all sorts of different verticals, right? So like biotech or computer science, chemical engineering or whatever you kind of want to take. Uh, you know, user experience design, I remember those standing out to me and um, I think CS 147 or something was one that I took. And, uh, and working in the accelerator world, we're, we're basically uh, an angel investment fund and helping startups um, kind of solve the problems they're facing at the moment and help them build good companies. I mean, you're, you're looking at uh, a lot of different companies. We've invested around 150 now, and they all do uh, different things in different verticals. And uh, I think my experience with MSE and um, helps me better uh, interact with each uh, founder. Uh, there might be something I don't understand at all, a like computer vision or, you know, something around uh, biotech or something. And, um, but because of the classes I took, I can at least have some common vocabulary that we can, that I can use to understand what they're doing. And um, that, so that's been valuable. Uh, it's not that I pretend like I know, but at least I can interact with them and, and figure out if, if uh, there's something interesting there and then dive deeper if needed and learn what I don't know. Um, and so that's been really helpful for me, both in helping uh, identify good investments, uh, mentoring others, uh, and also with just our team where we need to have a variety of backgrounds in, the, in, in, our, in our staff. We have around 20 people. And so being able to use management practices that we may have learned plus uh, combined with understanding, you know, how our design team works or engineering term or team or uh, design thinking team, um, I can kind of, kind of speak to kind of each of the departments, I guess. So it, because, because I'm in a multifaceted or multi-tool kind of in a space, uh, Embassy was perfect for that. Yeah. And I'll just echo um, what you both just shared going into consulting. It was a little bit of a black hole, uh, like as far as uh, who I was going to support uh, as a client or the type of the types of projects or roles. Uh, so just being able to like jump in and kind of hit the ground running, which was the expectation on a lot of these projects. I think you just really pick up those skills at Stanford, like not just like an MSNE, but like learning how to balance a lot of different um, deadlines and like demanding tasks and working with others. I know that in some of the MSNE classes. Uh, also like E145 really comes to mind, like working in as a team with, you know, in my case, it was like with seniors and juniors who had like all these other priorities and like learning how to balance that really helped me, especially early on when I first started um, in my consulting career. So we're going to be answering questions, uh, I guess, throughout the session, the ones that we've already kind of pre-designated, um, but then there might be questions that pop up from the audience and either we'll wait to the end, but this one question that just popped up, I think it makes sense to ask now. So what experiences or interests at Stanford led you to major in ms &E? How did you get on this path? I can start with, with this one. As I mentioned earlier, I started as pre-med and I was like, I don't wanna fall behind. So let me start taking all the chem classes and um, took the human biology core and kind of halfway through that sophomore year, just realized that by you know, having conversations with classmates, with other people in my dorm, that there were so many other opportunities on campus, uh, specifically around technology and the innovation that was happening around us that I kind of realized that I wasn't necessarily taking advantage of all, those, all of those resources by staying with human biology. It was a great major, um, great professors, great courses, but I realized that at least for me and my kind of like from my point of view that I was gonna get the most out of my time at Stanford in a major that, you know, as we mentioned earlier, covered a lot of different verticals and had a broad um, kind of reach as far as topics, everything from economics to entrepreneurship to, uh, policy and healthcare. Um, and yeah, so just through conversations uh, with some with my advisor and with some friends, I've kind of was like, oh, what's this MSNE acronym? What does it stand for? To kind of realize that 
it would have provided those opportunities for me to just become more involved and learn more about technology and the innovation that was happening around us. David, do you want to go next? Yeah, sure. I forgot what the question was. It was what experiences led you? Um, for me, I, I don't know, you know, the other panelists, their experience. I, I was the first one in my family to go away to college. Um, and so I kind of was just running by the seat of my pants for most of undergrad. And uh, I, I think the experiences that kind of really pushed me into it was I was pretty focused on startups and trying to get the ball rolling. Um, I, I had my own little tiny non-technical company when I was a sophomore. And MSNE just kind of jumped out to me as like the startup degree. Um, in hindsight, it might have been better to get like a CS or something if I wanted to go deep into a, into a topic. Um, but I thought that it would give me the broad base and it did. And that was kind of the hook uh, that, that really got me started. As you can see, my path didn't end up, you know, necessarily in that space, um, but, but that's, what, that's what drove me there in the first place. Yeah, for me, uh, I, a little different, I guess I wasn't the first in my family to go to college, but I guess first in the US. So, you know, my stepdad, you know, studied in Cuba. And so you kind of are slotted into whatever you're going to do there. Uh, and then my mom uh, studied in Dominican Republic and uh, she went into dentistry, uh, but, you know, she kind of knew what she was going to do uh, forever. Um, so when I, uh, when I came to college, I just had no idea. I didn't even know what engineering was. I kind of assumed it has something to do with like running a train, right? You're like train engineer. Uh, and so um, I remember uh, my, I think it was uh, first or second quarter, I was hanging out in Casa Zapata and uh, I was with a, a guy named uh, uh, Gilbert Duenas and, and he, he, he was MSNE. And I was just saying, hey, I like science. I like business. I like econ and math, a lot of different things what um you know I, and I just said i didn't even i wasn't asking for advice and he's like you know you should do msne and and i was like what is that so i just started taking random classes in it and i never i didn't end up declaring until junior year very late in junior year too uh so i was i always felt like i was behind you know the second half of stanford and and so i was taking you know 2021 20, units the last five quarters just to graduate on time and uh but that that was kind of my experience just somebody else serendipitously tell, telling me what it was, uh, you know, going back, I, similarly, I probably would have taken maybe a few more CS classes or even done that. That was probably the career I would have done otherwise. Uh, but but I, I absolutely loved them as me. It was, I loved every class I took and, and um, everything I learned from it. So there was another question in the chat and it kind of makes sense just to ask it now rather than wait. Um, it says, did you have your current career in mind when you decided to major in MSME? Uh, for me, no, I didn't, I didn't know, I didn't even know about startups until maybe junior year. Uh, I, I always did some kind of business since I was little, trying to make money, didn't make an allowance. So I, I was always selling something or, or finding some way to hustle. Uh, so I didn't know that you could build a company that didn't make any money and was worth a bunch of money, right? So, so, um, and uh, so I, I didn't think about the startup world. I didn't think about, um, I, I didn't know anything of, uh, of what I was doing, uh, jumping into MSNE. Yeah, that, that's a hard no for me. I did not think I was going to be a lawyer. Um, yeah, and if anything, my my dad said, you know, he said to my brother, actually, you're going to be the lawyer. He said I was going to be the doctor and my sister was going to be the teacher. And so my kind of default was like, I want to be none of those things. Um, so yeah, definitely didn't think I was going to be a lawyer. Mariana? Yep, I had no idea what a consultant was when I first started Stanford. And I don't think it was really something that I really wrapped my head around um, until I actually started <laughs> at Accenture. Um, I think it was such a big buzzword by the end of junior year, the beginning of senior year, that it was just kind of like, well, I don't know what else I'm gonna do. Um, graduation's coming up, um, whether I like it or not. So let me like give this a try because it seems like that's what a lot of people go into when they graduate college. Um, also, I, yeah, so that's kind of how I fell into it. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, I guess, like a good reminder to, you know, not be afraid to ask, um, to reach out to alumni. Um, if 
you're interested in learning more about a role or a company and what it means to actually be in that specific function. Thank you. So the next question is, um, did you feel accepted and welcomed at Stanford as a Latinx student? I can go. So I did. Um, I absolutely did. And I, for me, uh, such a big part of my Stanford experience was the fact that I was part of Mariachi Cardenal. And I remember that on move-in day, uh, Centro was hosting some sort of like welcome. And I walked over with my sister and I saw Mariachi performing and I couldn't believe it. I was like, what do you mean there's like a Mariachi at Stanford out of all places? Like I had grown up listening to the music and was kind of over it by the time I got to Stanford. I was like, can we listen to something else? And then getting to campus and seeing current students like play the music and enjoy it so much was really refreshing. So I joined the group. Um, we weren't all like coming from Latinx backgrounds. We had pretty much a, like a full range of representation from backgrounds and ethnicities. And I really enjoyed that. Uh, but through Mariachi, one, I realized that Stanford really supported students in hosting these clubs. And we offered a, like a class that was on the, um, like well, not the the course catalog that anyone could sign up for. Um, and we had received funding to pay for instructors who were coming from like the traditional mariachi background. And that to me again, was just like amazing. So it was like an indirect way that I felt that Stanford like really supported um, us as students, not just necessarily from like an, a Latinx background, but th through that experience, I also felt like I got to share a little bit of my background and a little bit of my heritage with not only like my classmates, but the broader Stanford community. A lot of alumni would kind of book us for their events um, during alumni weekend, or if they were having some mixer at their house. Um, so it was just like a really fun way to uh, meet people. And I, I think just kind of also get it, like learn more about the greater Stanford community. David or Jose, who wants to take the lead? I, I can jump on jump in on this one. I think my experience was a little different. Um, I won't say, you know, I, I wasn't accepted or anything like that. I, I think Stanford was great and generally pretty welcoming. And I don't think my Hispanic background, I, I'm Puerto Rican Mexican, by the way, I don't think that that really kind of came out and played and was an impediment or, or negative at all. But one thing that I did I didn't really feel it at the time, but I do feel it kind of reflecting on it in hindsight, is it felt a little easy to fall through the cracks. Now, Mariana, it sounds like you had a great experience. You latched on to like a, a good group and good core group of friends and, and stuff like that. But I think one thing that may have been overlooked, and it may also be timing, right? I, I'm class of 09, I started in 2004, uh, was that I don't think Stanford had a great sense of first gens who still had to support family um, or be directly involved with, maybe not directly financially supporting family yet, but still, you know, decision making, and uh, and just kind of the idea that, yes, I'm at a world renowned institution with, you know, kind of basically every asset you could have as a student, but I still have one foot tied in my community, my household, my family, and uh, and it's it's frankly impossible to separate the two. Um, and it maybe is kind of more unique to my situation, but maybe it isn't. And I think, um, I, I just think that that was a topic and kind of a, a concept that was just not explored and not talked about. And, and I think that might have been something that could have made me feel more connected. But just because of my, you know, my situation, the fact that I, I still had to help my family at home, you know, and then, you know, it's not a huge difference between the Bay Area and LA, but there still is a difference. You know, it's not like my family was in Palo Alto and I could just drive five minutes. Um, and so always having one foot out sometimes made it difficult to really dive in and embrace the culture and embrace the connection. Um, so I, I don't think it was necessarily anything, you know, that Stanford did wrong. I think it was more just kind of a missed opportunity, probably from myself and probably just from lack of experience. 
Yeah, for um, for me, it was I, I, di I did feel accepted. Uh, yeah, there was, there was no question. Um, it was a, a little different for me because, as I mentioned, I lived all over the world, and and my family is a combination. Of, like I'm part I'm part Puerto Rican, Spanish, Dominican, kind of a conglomerate of, of things and others, and. Uh, I've been exposed to a lot of different cultures and usually was in cosmopolitan cities everywhere. Um, and, but I hadn't really interacted too much with Mexican American culture. Uh, and so coming to Stanford and being in Casa Zapata, which is you know Mexican themed dorm was actually a new experience for me. Like it was, uh, it was, it felt as if, yeah, it was just a different um, experience. And so um, it, it was confusing for me in the beginning to to be like, okay, you know, why is there only a Mexican theme norm? Why not other Hispanic or Latin cultures? Um, and so for me, it was kind of like a double uh, culture experience kind of thing, not culture shock, but just different uh, experience where you have Stanford and that community, and then also like a, a new culture that I'm very in, ingrained into because that's the theme of the dorm. Um, and so, so that was that was a bit of uh, of my experience where, and I never felt not accepted in any way, uh, but it was just a little, yeah, it was just, it, it was a different experience, I guess. So, <laughs> and also that's what college is for, right? I, I don't mean to be negative about my experience. It, it's you know you're exploring. You're an 18 year old kid when you start, or 17, and you know trying to learn how to assimilate and react and interact with you know, thousands of people. So it, it was good. I just don't want people to think I was negative on it. Yeah. Um, being in the School of Engineering, and as far as representation goes within the, you know, obviously Latinx students, how did that affect you, your courses and things like that and being in classes where maybe, you know, there weren't a lot of Latinx students? It never, it, it never was, a, um, uh, as I mentioned, coming from just a variety of, of, of or just kind of cities where there was a lot of there were a lot of different cultures. I never really noticed it. Um, uh, I think I just have that mentality though that I'm like I'm trying to make the best of wherever I'm at. So uh, I I don't try to think unless it's blatantly obvious. I don't try and think like oh I'm the only you know Hispanic person in the room. I try to just say okay I'm I'm here and I'm gonna do my best and I'm gonna make it so it's irrelevant whether I am you know what I look like um, and. Uh, I, yeah, so so with MSNU specifically, I always felt like it was really, um, it was a very, there was a lot of diversity in, uh, in, in the classes in general, just because of how broad the, the, um, the major is. Like, I didn't do econ, but I would figure that somebody who chooses econ, like maybe somebody told them econ's great, but like nobody told me, you know, econ is great or, or engineering is great or whatever. So uh, I feel like maybe MSNU as a result is conducive to just, people who want to kind of explore a lot of different things. And so uh, maybe almost as a result is, is, is diverse, but I always felt like my classes uh, were diverse um, and, and didn't feel, um, even if maybe I was the only Latin person in a room, there were all sorts of other sub um, cultures and everything, so. David, did you wanna? Yeah, I can jump in. Um, I, I would echo everything Jose said. Um, and, and I would just say maybe, you know, thinking about it, maybe I was the only, maybe I wasn't. I can't even remember. It, you know, I, I was in class. That's what I remember. Um, I, I never remember feeling kind of out of place or being self-conscious about that. Um, yeah, so it, I don't think it really affected me. Mariana, did you want to? Um, I would, like agree with uh, both Jose and David. I will say that for me, it was a little bit of a or maybe not a coincidence, but like my best friend uh, was MSNE and he's also from, uh, has like his parent, both his parents are Mexican. He grew up in Fort Worth and was part of Mariachi. Um, and we had other close friends. Um, so to me, like I can like very vividly or specifically recall, like yes, there were other like Latinx students in MSNE. Um, kind of similar to Jose, though, I was because I declared MSNE pretty late in the game. I felt that I was always taking classes with uh, students like two years below me, um, just because of like how the 
uh, major is structured. So it's interesting because like, you know, my friends had more or less already taken those classes, um, but I knew they were like part of the, the major, but then I was like in classes with like under or not like other like freshmen and sophomores. So if anything, that to me was like what stood out and what I remember where I was like, I feel like I don't know anyone here because they're not in my class. But then I started recognizing everyone because we kind of just kept going, moving from like one class to the next um, as we progressed through the, through the major. And in terms of, um, I guess, facing any challenges, did you face any challenges as a Latinx professional in a particular career or industry? Go for it, Mariana. Okay. Um, I think the challenge has been more around just learning how to advocate for myself. So there hasn't been necessarily like one specific example where I felt that because I'm of Latinx descent, I've been either denied certain opportunities or, you know, kind of passed over for uh, certain roles or promotions or what have you. Um, but what I have learned is that being able to advocate for yourself, whether it's raising your hand and asking for more responsibility or letting your manager know that you are, you know, very much interested in being promoted or being taken into consideration for other roles is something that's like difficult or for me to kind of embrace. Um, I think part of that's a little bit of a cultural thing. Um, I think part of it has to do with being a woman. I think part of that has to do with being, you know, Mexican American. Um, so it's something that like, I'm very much aware of. Um, and have learned that, you know, if I really want to advance my career, I have to become comfortable and have to be comfortable raising my hand and kind of asserting myself in, you know, at my company or within my team or the organization that I'm part of and that I can't just like kind of sit back, put my head down and hope that like the hard work will be enough to kind of grant me all of those opportunities. So it's something that, Again, it hasn't necessarily been like, oh, like you're gonna like, you know, because you're of Latinx descent, um, you won't be able to take advantage of certain opportunities. It's more of like a, oh wait, you didn't tell us that you wanted to be considered for this. Or, you know, you haven't voiced that you were actually interested in, you know, being put in a role that was going to push your, you know, like your skill set. Like, had you told me I would have like put you in that role three weeks ago or like a month ago and, um, you know, having some of those conversations kind of made me realize like, oh, okay, this is different. Um, and I think part of that has to do with, you know, just making that shift from an academic background where if, you know, you submit your problem problem sets, if you study hard enough and you, you know, ace your tests, you're going to be rewarded with a good grade. Um, and in the workforce, it's been a little bit more of like, it's not just the hard work. You also have to kind of like, like I said, like raise your hands, find mentors, find sponsors and, let it be known that you, you know, want a seat at the table. Thank you. Anybody else want to add to that? Yeah, I, I don't mind chiming in. Um, I think generally the legal industry sucks at diversity uh, and they know it, people in the industry know it. Um, it it's not for lack of trying, uh, I just think a lot of the the kind of efforts that they, you know, try to get rolling, are ineffective for you know many reasons. Not not worth going into here. So, with that in mind, though, I think since there is kind of this interest and drive to try to make you know the legal environment more diverse, we do get some shots. You know, I, I won't I won't call it necessarily being an asset even to be diverse, because it comes with its own challenges, that's that's for sure. Um, but at least I feel like in the legal industry, they're consciously trying to look for people, you know, who may have been overlooked. So that could be like a useful starting point to, to start a good conversation. But I think probably the biggest challenge that I faced and that others, you know, and my, my, my close friends have faced is more kind of the soft skills of of building that close mentorship and sponsorship with people who just have dramatically different backgrounds and lifestyles from you. Um, you know, it's, 
I, I, I have, uh, I'll give you an example. Um, one of the partners, I'm very good friends with him and like him a lot. He's from North Carolina and he'd never had a good taco, like ever in his life, period. And the firm had a retreat in uh, uh, San Diego. And then we had a drive from San Diego to LA to meet with some clients. And so like we stopped at, at one of my favorite places, which he thought was you know fantastic, but it was just kind of until that moment, I don't think he fully grasped kind of how, how different his background was from mine. And, uh, and it kind of created a nice bonding experience, but it does make you realize that, you know, for, for every one of him, there's a hundred other partners that I work with who just come from night and day different worlds and just don't, don't have that kind of instant connection. And I think Jose made some great comments about always being able to find something to build that connection from, as opposed to focusing on what you don't have. But I think having to force the issue and really scrape and, and try to come up with something to be connected with is different than having kind of an environment where you can just naturally, you know, your, your hobbies, traits, and interests happen to match with the 20 people around you. Um, and I don't think the legal community is there yet. And I think having to take that conscious effort to build the gap after a while can be fatiguing. Um, you're always feeling like you have to not necessarily have a mask on, but really push yourself and drive yourself to force a connection and then hope that it grows organically from there. Um, and, and I think, uh, you know, it'd be a lot easier and nicer if, you know, I didn't have to, you know, force that organic, you know, relationship and let it be more organic. <laughs> Thank you, David. Yeah, I, I just, I guess, keep it short. I, I really, I really have it. Uh, thankfully, um, uh, I think every once in a while I'm, I, I'm, I'm aware of the fact that I'm the only Hispanic person because, you know, we might have, you know, we might be looking at a thousand companies and notice that like, you know, statistically it's like 3% uh, Latinx uh, are founders usually. So um, uh, I might notice that and, and say, wait, what, what's going on? Or, or I'll be at a venture capital or angel investment event and pretty much only only white people uh, around uh, and and then kind of sometimes I notice it and if and if I dwell on it I might think I start going down a dark path of like what are they thinking and are, you know VCs are all about pattern recognition what does this mean what you know and uh, so um, uh, but usually that's that's more I haven't experienced it overtly and it's usually if anything self-sabotage in a scenario where I then feel uncomfortable uh, and, and I'm not able to quote unquote shine or, or whatever. Um, uh, but I can't say that I've experienced it myself or I'm too optimistic and, and kind of, sh you know, I, I give people the benefit of the doubt and just assume it, it, it was some other reason or whatever, so. Thank you, Jose. So the next question is, what advice would you give to students starting um, their career now? I can jump on this one. Um, I, I think I would tell them, of course, you know, the schoolwork is important and do a good job, but value your friendships. Um, I mean, you, you just, it's hard to fathom when you're an undergrad, how quickly time is going to fly, how different people's paths are going to be, and how truly remarkable your colleagues, classmates, and friends are, and, and you know, will continue to, to do things in the world. And, uh, you know, when I, when I sit here and if I think about what, what did I wish I do more, it, it'd be, you know, continue to stay connected with my friends. Um, just life has a way of kind of getting, you know, where you just, you have kids, you do this, you do that. And, and it's easy to feel that you're growing apart from your friends. And, and I feel like it's a missed opportunity to just kind of enjoy the finer things of life, you know, of broad connections with people. And it doesn't hurt career-wise um, if you stay connected because you just never know where people are going to end up, where you're going to end up, and, and how you can support each other. Mariana, did you want to? Yeah, sure. Um, well, kind of building on, on, on that point that David just brought up, um, you know, I'm someone that kind of whenever I hear networking, I, I cringe, like at the thought of like, oh, I have to go and, you know, put on a fake smile or like meet people. Um, but it's so important. 
um, like don't underestimate the value. And to David's point, it's like staying connected with classmates, with friends. Um, you know, I will say that my current role now at Stripe, I actually um, was referred uh, by one of the, um, well, he was, I can't remember if the RA or the RCC in Toyon Hall my sophomore year. Um, and we happened to be connected on LinkedIn and I was recruiting and, you know, he posted the the link and was like, if we have any questions, reach out. And I was like, hey, it's been uh, probably 10 years at this point, right? Like, do you have 10 minutes um, to connect? Kind of just like, you know, if you could share some details on what the rule is, like what I should be on the lookout for. And um, it, it was great. He like replied, he kind of supported me throughout the entire process. And if I'm being honest, like, you know, if I didn't have that referral, I don't know that, how that would have worked out for me. Um, so, you know, you never know where people are going to end up. You don't, you never know where you're going to end up either. So yeah, definitely um, investing in like relationships um, is, I think is key. Uh, I, I will also kind of like go back to what I mentioned earlier about just learning how to advocate for yourself. Um, I think part of that is setting goals. I, I think when I first started, I was like, I have a job. I just, you know, have to deliver on the work, um, but never really stopped to think like, what do I want to get out of this opportunity? Like, you know, like a year from now, like what are the skills that I want to walk away with? Or, um, you know, when it could have been anything from skills to saying like, I've worked on three projects or I've picked up SQL and, you know, something else. Um, and I think that's actually really important. I was lucky that it worked out for me and that, you know, I walked away from a project being like, oh, I now have all these skills. But again, now looking back, I'm like, oh, maybe that was just luck um, where I got lucky that it really worked out for me because then that set me up, set me up for my next role and I was able to build on that. Um, but, you know, sometimes I'm like, I should be a little bit more intentional about what I'm trying to get out of a specific company or a specific role or a specific opportunity. And it doesn't have to be super specific, but I think just having almost like a little checklist that you can, you know, um, ch uh, kind of check in with yourself every once in a while, I think is also helpful. Thank you, Mariana. Yeah, I think uh, in, in line with both of those, and, and it, I, that wasn't my original thought, but I, I realize it's, it's such a good one. It's just the people, absolutely, uh, by far. The, the the biggest thing in, in my career in my life really um, uh, you know I, I too hate the term networking but even though it's a a day-to-day -day thing that comes natural to me I, I hate it because I don't see it as networking I see it as just meeting interesting people um, and when people are like somebody tells me like oh Jose you know he knows everyone he's so well networked I cringe because I, suddenly the people I know become an asset and and that's not what it is for me it's like I just want to help people and when I connect them I believe I'm helping them uh, so, um, uh, but, but it really does come down, uh, to people. I, I, I know that during my undergrad, I, uh, maybe went too far on the, on the people and relationship side. And, and I think my academics slipped as a result. Uh, um, I really, you know, if somebody was like, Hey, let's hang out or whatever. I was always, I mean, I don't think I ever said no. So, you know, I, I remember having problem sets for econ one, a do at like midnight or something. And I'd go, you know, we'd have soccer every night uh, indoor soccer like 11 p.m and uh and i knew that i didn't put enough time to get it done but i wasn't going to skip out on on that soccer game uh, i probably should have skipped some of those but um but i i know that you know one thing i really focused on was helping people that were struggling in, in undergrad like people that you know emotionally struggling or who were lonely or whatever and and my thinking was you know i'm one person i'm gonna have an impact in the world but if i can everyone here at stanford is gonna have crazy impact in the world if i can help 10 other people and and you know maybe i'll sacrifice my gpa or whatever else but like 10 other people do well that maybe would enough because they're better emotionally or whatever uh that's worth it for me and so i always focus on just getting to know people and and helping them if they needed something and uh, and 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 now i mean so much of what i do is just i do reach out to alumni or, or, or people that i know it was hard applying to grad schools uh for sure because of my a, a kind of lower gpa but um now that I'm past that, uh, the people that I know have been critical in everything from finding jobs. Like my, when I worked at Google, it was because somebody put up a, a post on Facebook saying, does anyone have, you know, 
design and Photoshop skills in the Bay that's looking for a new role. And, and it was somebody I went to, I studied abroad with in Germany. Um, and, and even right now, I guess just yesterday, I reached out to a friend that I needed an intro to a company that we were interested in. And, and I asked them and they, they said, yeah, well, I know them, I'll, I'll, I'll connect to you. So um, the people are, are absolutely critical. Thank you. Um, so the next question is, and it kind of piggybacks off of, I guess, what Jose kind of mentioned uh, about his experience at Stanford, but what things should students consider while they're still at Stanford? Maybe looking back. Study abroad, study abroad, study abroad. <laughs> it's like the greatest experience ever. You're saying that during the pandemic, if people are going to feel bad, they can't. I don't think they're studying abroad right now. <laughs> oh, is that not a thing right now? I'm sorry for all current students, but study abroad really was that great. I think there might be a virtual study abroad, though. That's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I, I agree. I, I think I think study abroad was, was great. Um, I did Berlin and um, I, after getting rejected from like two before that. Uh, so I, I think I originally took Portuguese so I can go to Brazil, but we don't have a Brazil program. Um, uh, I, I think I think learn a lot. I mean, you're in MSNE, which is broad already. Take a, a lot of different like learn a lot because um, I, I guess it depends on where you're going. If you're going to be maybe, a you know, software engineer, then I guess go deep more on, on the software side. But um, everything I took, uh, I, I've, I've applied in some way. Um, and, you know, I love the classes in, in user experience design. And I think, you know, Marianne, I think you mentioned like engineering 145, which I think was uh, in innovation or, or, or Rita Catilla, I think. Uh, that was with buyers. It was like the entrepreneurship course. Oh, okay. I put together yeah. like the like a business mm -hmm. model and percent and like a deck and the VCs yep. and whatnot. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I had Chuck Easley for that one. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and, and, and that was great because I, I took a startup that I built there and, and pursued it for about two years. Um, but as just take classes and, and interesting things and, and learn and uh, cause that's also important because then you also diversify who, who you know, as far as like, cause you're going to meet a lot of the same people in MSC. So like you get to meet people in totally random, uh majors if, if you take random classes but um what one thing I, I just took away from stanford was a love for learning uh that i think was like grown i didn't know i loved learning so much until i think uh stanford where now I, i'm just constantly just devouring new information and new um uh, just more knowledge which uh, uh just because it, it helps me when you're when especially in the investment world when you're looking at ideas that are uh just outside of your realm Yeah, well, I actually didn't go abroad. Um, and it's something that every so often, <laughs> well, I did Stanford in Washington, um, was between that and Chile. And every so often I do wonder, it's like, man, maybe I should have just gone abroad and like skipped over Stanford in Washington. Uh, but that kind of brings me to my point of uh, be okay to step outside of like your comfort zone. Um, I think it goes also hand in hand with like, just learning and it's, it's not just like in the classroom, but it's like learning more about yourself. I think I was so used to like this high school mindset of like, I just need to get the good grades or like, and so goal oriented that I kind of kept myself from, from trying new things on campus, whether it was a, a new class on a topic that I had no idea um, or had no experience in to, you know, deciding to do Chile versus Stanford in Washington. Um, which I decided to do because they had an internship attached to it. And I was like, well, I need to go get the internship so that I can be prepared for when I graduate. And I was like, I'm sure things would have worked out at, at the end, right? Not that I'm saying that like Stanford and Washington wasn't a great experience either, but um, like you're never really gonna get a chance to um, go study abroad with like no responsibilities with Stanford kind of supporting you, you know, and having that safety net there. So. Yeah, it's a, it's a combination of like learning how to like push yourself to be uncomfortable and taking the risk while like learning about yourself and, and new topics. Thank you. So uh, I, oh, go ahead. Sorry, go uh, ahead. Sorry, I, I, had, I had one other thing, which um, if I could look back, one, one thing that would have, I think, helped me is I felt a lot of pressure uh, kind of not knowing what I wanted. Um, and, but it seemed like everyone in MSNE was either doing consulting, investment banking, uh, or I guess a, a startup. And um, I always, 
I had no idea what investment banking was. I still probably don't know. Uh, and I, di I didn't know what consulting was at the time. Um, and it always felt like I was behind. And, and, um, and I don't think you should, you should feel, feel that. Uh, I don't know, like ask people and, and learn about it. I don't know if, how I would change it, like take that pressure off. Um, but uh, I remember feeling that and, and um, I'm glad I went down the entrepreneurship side. Um, uh, so, so I guess my advice is don't feel that pressure uh, instead kind of learn about it, but like, it's okay if you don't end up in consulting or, or, or investment banking. Um, and, then, and then similarly on the, on the entrepreneurship or sorry, on the internship side, um, I, I remember spending one summer because I didn't get an internship because my grade wasn't, grades weren't good enough. Um, uh, that I spent it with my family. Um, I think it was my first summer and I don't regret that at all. I mean, my mom passed away uh, a few years later and I didn't know at the time, but I'm very glad that I didn't, uh, didn't get an internship that time because I got to spend one more summer with my family. Um, and, um, and I think that is, that is an experience, at least for me, uh, that that's worth it. So, uh, don't, don't feel pressure if your, your path doesn't look like everyone else's. Um, uh, you know, you you make up for it. You can work the rest of your life, I guess, but you can only spend so much time with your family. So. Yeah, that, that reminds me of two points. Um, one, I, I would advise, and I did not do this, and this is why I'm advising it, to build relationships with your professors or TAs or, or you know, those, those people. Um, I, I was pretty terrible at it. I would just go in my room, bash my head on the wall work-wise, and, and if I got it, I got it. If I didn't, you know, oh well. And uh, in hindsight, it would have been better to reach out and work with people. And I think kind of would have helped with the sense of community. And uh, the other point, and Jose kind of reminded me of it, is, uh, yeah, I mean, especially, uh, you know, with, with pandemic, you guys are very well aware that things are likely not going to go exactly how you plan them. Um, I, I probably had, I, I'd be willing to gamble I had worse grades than Jose. And, uh, and after graduating... And we'll, we'll bet a drink on it or something. A after graduating, um, it was rough. And, you know, at some point you kind of wonder, you know, am I really, you know, was it a waste? Did I screw up? Should I have, you know, done more work, this and that? But give it enough time and things shake out. Um, so, you know, taking some of that pressure off your shoulders, I think is key to helping move you forward. Thank you, David. So, Kind of, I guess, piggybacking off just what you guys shared so far and just like your experience at Stanford and I guess um, as far as like students dealing with imposter syndrome, uh, as Latinx or, or even as a first generation student, did you ever deal with that at Stanford? Anybody? Sorry, I, I the imposter syndrome question, I, I was distracted. Um, Kind of. Uh, I, I think the imposter syndrome probably hits me more as a lawyer because I am a little bit more aware of being the only Latino in the room sometimes. Um, in undergrad, there were definitely the days I didn't get it and definitely the days I didn't know how to reach out to build those connections. And I won't say that it, it led to you know, uh, imposter syndrome, like a textbook case, but I knew something was off and didn't have a good way to fix it. And that led to general feelings of like forlornness. And so, uh, yeah, that's what I would say. But I mean, it wasn't there all the time. It's just, it comes and goes. Did anybody else want to add to that or? Yeah, um, kind of along those lines, I think for me, it, it sometimes manifested in not feeling comfortable asking for help when I shut up because, you know, I'd look around and be like, oh, but everyone else is like, okay. And, you know, feeling like I kind of had to put up this front that like, I can do this because like, I need to prove that I belong here. When in reality, it's like, there was just so many resources on campus from TAs to professors, to advisors, to, you know, like um, others, staff um, that are there to help. Um, and they're not gonna judge you for like 
kind of raising your hand or, you know, booking some time with someone. Um, when I was making my decision to switch over to MS&E, um, I'd been told by one ad a pre-med advisor, like, oh, it's too late, like, don't bother. And um, I actually took the time to go chat with Lori Cottle, who was, I think, running like the MS&E um, office at the time. And I still remember I like wanted to like go across her desk and give her a hug because she just like looked at me and she's like, who told you, you can't do this? Like, no, no, no. Like, and grabbed a piece of paper and just like mapped out like the remaining like two and a half years for me on campus. Um, in that moment, like I still remember that day, right? Like it was such a like a sense of like validation, but I've realized now it's like, I could have had that conversation like months or like weeks like before when I actually did and it would have saved me so much stress but again there was this almost this like pressure that like everyone's going to figure it out like you don't have to go ask for help and like that's such a lie like don't be afraid to reach out to people and have multiple conversations if you're not happy with the first answer that you that you get so Lori's still here Lori's fantastic. oh really yeah. she's my yeah. boss she, she's the only reason I graduated yeah <clears throat> Yeah, I think same here. <laughs> At least in the four year time frame. Like for me, I don't know why I was like, I had made it such a goal that it's like, I should graduate in four years. Like I shouldn't take a fifth year. Um, and I, you know, wanted to do Stanford and Washington and whatnot. And she kind of like just, like I mentioned, mapped everything out. And she's like, no, nope, you have wiggle room. Like you can go this quarter and then you can switch these classes out. And yeah, she was definitely a lifesaver. Nice. So um, we have questions from the audience. Uh, I want to give them time to ask questions as well because we're kind of rolling down on time. Um, so the first one is, what was your favorite non ms &E class? Best resources on campus? Question mark. Uh, for me, CS147, uh, which was about prototyping and or human intro to human computer interaction. Um, I think Scott Clemmer, uh, he's got a bunch of awards and he went UC Irvine or something afterwards. but. Uh, yeah, 147, because it just taught you how to problem solve and, and build things quickly and, and, and innovate. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there. Anybody else? My, my abroad stuff, Japanese companies and, and things like that, I thought were pretty interesting and I ended up using it later when I moved back. Thank you. So the next question is for people who are graduating soon and still aren't sure what to do after graduation, what two or three things should I start with to figure out, um, I guess, what I wanna do as far as the job goes? I think that's a pretty, uh, my answer would be specific depending on the person's situation kind of. Um, you know, do you need money? Do you not need money? You know, that, that's a huge one for me. Um, I, I needed the money, didn't have a job, ended up finding like an intermediary position before law school and kind of used grad school as like a reset button. So that's one good tip. Um, I, I don't know that person's situation, but you know, if things don't look so grand, you still have a shiny Stanford degree under your name and probably you know some good experiences that you could spend to get you into another level of school and then crush it. And then hopefully you have more opportunities there. Um, otherwise, network, 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 figure out who's got what you're looking for and, and you know, ask around. Anyone else want to add to that? Yeah, I, I will say, um, and I think this didn't click for me until I was at business school that um, being a student is kind of like a ticket to talk to anyone that you want to. Like, you'd be surprised at how many people will be like, if you reach out, I like cold email or cold LinkedIn message and you drop in that you're a student, um, Stanford student, I'd be, you know, I feel like you, you get a pretty high response rate. Like people, one, love talking about themselves and like what they do. Two, I think right now during COVID are looking for, you know, like something to, to break up the, their routine. But three, um, I do think that people just like feeling like they're helping students and learning from students too. Like, I think a lot of alumni just wanna hear what it's like being a student right now or what's going on on campus. But um, all of that is to say, like, take this opportunity to uh, reach out to alumni and just have like conversations of, I'm, you know, what is it that you do? Like, I have no idea. Can you, you know, I'm still trying to decide what to do. And it's like very low risk conversations where you can learn a lot from these individuals and 
at least start getting an idea of like, okay, yes, like maybe consulting's for me or like maybe ops or maybe marketing or, you know, what have you um, that, you know, it might seem like I personally don't really like reaching out to people or like always make a big deal, but like people are happy to talk to you. Like you're not really bothering them. Like the worst that can happen is that they're just not going to reply to your email and don't take it personal. Like just keep finding a new alumni every day to, to reach out to. Um, the other advice that I'd gotten from like the business school perspective was to create a list of companies that you admire or products that you really like and start doing company research there. Um, I think this is more just of like a tactical approach of trying to identify like verticals or industries that you're interested in. But, you know, to, to David's point, I guess it really depends on, on your situation or like what it is that you're trying to, to, to do next. Thank you. Um, I That's guess, smart. yeah, go ahead, Jose. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think reach out to, uh, just cause we're at time, or reach out to people. Um, and, and also the Stanford name goes a lot further outside of the Bay Area. Uh, you kind of feel like you're a, a failure because you haven't sold the company for 50 million by the time you're 23 or whatever. Uh, you go, I mean, Colorado or anywhere else and, and people, it, it goes a lot further where you can just say, okay, you at least get that first call or, or, or chance to talk about a, an opportunity. Um, so even if you're not a student, but you have the Stanford name, uh, just don't think bigger than just, uh, uh, than just the Bay. Um, especially if you're not sure what to do, it's better to do something somewhere else than nothing in the Bay Area. So. Okay, so I think that pretty much wraps up our time. Um, I don't know if you guys want to add any last words before we conclude, but I just wanted to go ahead, David. I was just saying, keep hustling. Yeah, I think uh, one interesting thing for me in my, uh, in my career is I ended up also doing an MBA uh, and MSNE prepares you really well, well for the world because I, I don't know, uh, Mariana, your experience, but I felt like everything they were teaching me I already knew. Um, yep. <laughs> and, and, you know, it actually led to creating Boomtown Accelerators uh, because I was kind of kind of waiting for it to get hard and it wasn't because I had taken all this stuff before. Uh, so that there's two, a couple of things there. One is you're well prepared uh, to do business and to run teams and to manage others, or at least start getting experience of how to manage others as well, uh, at least as well as an MBA uh, by, by this major. Um, MSNE 180, I really, I just take a lot of notes there because I use that all the time. Um, and, uh, and at the same time, don't feel like you need to do an MBA in the future. Um, I would say because of MSNE, now I tell people, unless you're looking at a top 10 MBA program, I don't know if it's necessarily worth it because uh, there you get the network and the name and all that. As far as knowledge, I didn't feel like uh, it, it was it was mind blowing. Um, uh, what what I did in MBA as as far as like the the topics covered. So. Thank you, Jose. Yep. And I mean, I'll just say like enjoy it. The four years fly by. Um, I remember senior year was so bittersweet. <laughs> I, I, you know, with graduation approaching and whatnot. Um, but yeah, I would just encourage you all to take advantage as much as you can, you know, given our current situation of all the resources that uh, Stanford has to offer. Thank you, Mariana. Thank you, Jose. Thank you, David, for participating in our panel session tonight. We really appreciate you um, representing the department. And thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedules, I'm sure. So without any other, I guess, words, we'll just end it and conclude tonight's session. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks. thanks. For having us. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank Bye. you, guys.